So welcome everyone to the AIM Big Topic webinar. I'm Paul Ben Jackson and we started these webinars in 2015 and the first person to present was Steve Laybourne and he's back. <laughs> You've got a better memory than I have. I looked it up. <laughs> but I know I've done a couple of these before. You have done a couple of these before. <laughs> Always very entertaining and informative so I'm going to hand over to you for the next hour or so. Steve, thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to share some slides, but before I do that, I'm anticipating talking for 30, 35 minutes, maybe a bit longer. Um, happy for you to um, either post questions in the chat box or, you know, just, you know, um, butt in as we go along if you have any questions. But I am going to leave time for questions at the end as well. Okay, so um, hopefully you can see those slides now. Um, that's always a good sign. And I'm just going to make you guys a bit bigger and uh, open the chat box. And then uh, we'll start going. You've already started the video, Paul? Okay, great. Okay, so um, thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I've been a member of the Applied Improvisation Network for probably 10 years. Um, and as Paul said, I've done a couple of these before. Um, and I actually come at improvisation from a different perspective to many of you. Um, I'm a professor at Boston University. Uh, I work in a business school, which means that I, I actually look at improvisation from an organizational perspective rather from an individual and small group perspective, which I suspect many of you do. Um, so um, I lecture, I research, and I write about project management, innovation and change. And my interest in organizational improvisation came out of my PhD, which I um, completed in 2002, I think. Um, and I've been looking at improvisation and particularly the bricolage aspect of, imp of organizational improvisation for the last 20 years. And I was a project manager in the finance sector before I became an academic. So therefore, my research around improvisation tends to be done around pro projects and how project managers use this. But, you know, this is fairly um, common. I mean, say common to all um to all managers but you know all managers can use this it doesn't have to be just project managers so um i usually start off with this quote which a makes me feel that i have an affinity with albert einstein and b you can see obviously at the moment we're going to the same hairdresser um but um this, this quote is really about rationality versus intuition. And I'm glad I'm not the only one, Jim Bob. Um, and when we look at organizations, we tend to think in terms of process and structure and you know doing things by the book. Whereas in actual fact, intuition, which is a major part of, of organizational improvisation, is a really key thing. So the way I see it, you know, the intuitive mind um, looking at situations and reacting to them and deciding what to do um, almost simultaneously with starting to do them. And I'll come to, to, to that in a minute is a really big part of, of what um, of what I'm interested in. So. I suspect that you all know about improvising from a personal and a small group point of view. You know, for most of you, that's what you do. You know, many of you who uh, who are linked with the AIN are um, consultants or trainers or people who are trying to raise awareness of improvisational techniques 
within individuals and small groups and admittedly you know within organizations but you tend to come at this from the individual and small group level whereas I tend to look at it from the organizational level and historically um, within project management so I also try to justify why project managers should improvise and the traditional view of project management at least is um, plan and then execute the contents of that plan with the minimum of deviation, which to be fair, you know, doesn't sound very improvisational. But one of the things we've, that we understand, those of us who research in, in, the, in the domain, is that actually projects are not like that. And they've not been like that for 25 years. I mean, I started as a project manager in the early 90s. And at that point, all the books and all the instructions were plan, then execute. But we didn't actually do that. We planned. We started to execute and then things started to change and we improvised in order to get things done. So, you know, the plan, then execute thing just doesn't happen anymore. And just quickly, I wanted to go through three stages of wh where I see project management coming from, because that's, you know, my background. When I started in project management, it was a sort of project management 1.0, if you want to call it that, which was focused on process, following the plan, tools and techniques, Gantt charts, work breakdown structures, following an agreed plan with the minimum of deviation. That was what project management seemed to be about in the 90s and indeed before that. There was then a significant shift through certainly the late 90s and the first decade of, of, the, of this millennium, where <laughs> there was a real shift towards behavior, towards a focus on the fact that people deliver project tasks and activities. You can have the best Gantt chart, the best work, down, uh, work breakdown stru structure on the planet, but they don't actually deliver anything. Projects are delivered by people carrying out project tasks and activities in either individually or in small groups. And that means that, to my mind, projects are team based. They're socially constructed entities. They're as good as the people who work within them, uh, uh, within them. Um, and things like motivation, commitment, building trust, emotional intelligence, effective leadership, communication, all these things are really important because we have to deal with people and people deliver projects. We're now shifting into what I call an emerging 3.0 model with a focus on ambiguity, on the fact that people start to deliver projects, but know or certainly expect that projects are going to change as you move forward, that stuff is going to emerge um, that we weren't expecting, that external environments are going to change, uh, and that the project that you deliver probably won't be the project that you started off thinking about. And that means there's a shift away from structure. We have to understand things about emerging requirements, how to deal with uncertainty and complexity. And we have to actually modify the project as we move forward. So that's the way that I see project management having evolved over the last probably three decades. And one of the things about the emerging model that we're dealing with at the moment <clears throat> is that we need creativity and innovation. We need to understand that we need to be creative and we need to do things differently in order to deliver projects that are ambiguous and uncertain. That makes sense so far. Good, excellent. Excuse me a minute. So creativity and innovation are, are particularly important. And one of the good things about creativity and innovation is they can't be automated. You know, at the moment, I've been looking at some stuff recently around um, artificial intelligence and um, the automation of processes and the, autom the automation of repetitive work. Um, 
The thing with computers is that they just can't do that sort of stuff, you know? Um, and this is relevant to all management, not just to project management. So I found this cartoon a couple of days ago, and I thought that this actually really summed it up because what we need to focus on is the stuff that systems can't do, okay? This role requires a high level of soft skills. Can you persuade, influence, empathize, inspire, build rapport, manage emotions and behaviors, and maintain a sense of humor under pressure? Well, systems can't do that. People do that. And people who have improvisational and creative mindsets arguably can do that better than people who don't. So organizations are starting to accept the fact that we need to build skills in our people that maybe, you know, are skills that we didn't really look for when we interviewed them, but which are becoming more and more necessary. And if you want to keep your job in a situation where more and more jobs are being automated, then you need to be good at the soft stuff. And improvisational work depends on that, you know, empathy and inspiration and influence and all that stuff. So um, I feel that we're moving into a situation um, where as artificial intelligence becomes better, and it is becoming better. I mean, the, the, um, the improvement in artificial intelligence in the last three or four years has been dramatic. And in the next five will be, you know, a quantum leap forward again. Um, so we need to build skills that artificial intelligence can't build, you know, Computers are not very good at being empathetic and inspiring and, and you know, and, and building rapport. They just do as they're told. Um, they do as they're told very well. And, you know, smart systems are getting better at improving how, how they do things. But they can't do the stuff that we can do. And, you know... For organizations, and particularly for senior executives in organizations, this is becoming a really important deal. People, everybody here is trying to make sense of the future. What's it going to look like? What are we going to do? How are we going to cope? What skills do we need to survive and thrive and, you know, um, and hopefully dom dominate in some cases? I mean, look at Look at, you know, the way that Amazon has, you know, risen to the challenge of, you know, of the way that we need to achieve stuff in a pandemic. Um, and so there are all these things out there, you know, artificial intelligence, design thinking, innovation, culture, agile, digital transformation, stuff like that. Most of this stuff, people have to make sense of that. Machines can't. And that means that change is really important. We have to embrace change. And the trouble is that everybody agrees that change is necessary, but nobody really likes change. You know, it, it's, we build a sort of comfort bubble around ourselves where we're comfortable with what we're doing and how it's happening and, and with that, our level of skills to deal with it. And when things start to change, it, it, that people start to chip away at that bubble of comfort and you start to feel exposed. You know, what if th things change and, I, and then I can't cope? You know, that's a really uh, important issue. Um, and one of the things that came out of my PhD, by the way, was about <coughs> equipping people to cope with change. It was a really important part of the outcomes of the, the, of the study that I did. Um, you have to be proactive with people about how change is going to affect them and what the benefits are to them. So, you know, there are ways to manage change. And a lot of this is about communication, empathy, inspiration, all the things that we've already talked about. So the question comes, how can we be creative? And how can we innovate? And how can we improvise successfully 
within a discipline, and here I'm talking about project management, that's generally thought of as structured and controlled, where if you pick up a project management book, even now, you pick up a project management textbook, it will say, this is the way that you do projects. You plan, then you execute the contents of the plan with the minimum of deviation. And if stuff starts to change, you stop and you replan. Now, realistically, in modern organizations, you can't do that because you don't have time to do that. What actually happens in modern organizations is the person who's your boss, your project sponsor, whatever you want to call them, actually says, hey, Steve, you know, you're managing this project and, you know, you're delivering this by May. Well, actually, we don't need that anymore. We need this instead. And we could do with it by March. And we don't really care how you get there. But that's what we need. And, you know, that's sort of the antithesis of a controlled project processes and procedures, if you want to call them that. So what happens? is that project managers improvise and improvisations everywhere. We all do it. The best you can do is to try and control it. If we think about it, conversation is improvised because I can't respond until I've heard what you're saying. So if you think about a normal conversation or any sort of conversation, it's, it's an improvised event because Paul can ask me a question and I don't know what that question is until I've heard it. And then I have a few milliseconds or seconds if I buy myself some time by repeating the question to give myself some thinking time um, to respond to that. But I can't respond to it until I know, you know what I'm being asked. So conversation even at the banal level of, hey, you know, do you want to drink? You know, um, what would you like? Would you like a gin and tonic or would you like a vodka? And, you know, that's still improvised because you don't, you can't respond until you've heard the question. And then, you know, you get an improvised response back and conversation is improvised. So improvisation is everywhere. It's just, we don't think about it that way. The best you can do in organizations, because improvisation will happen, is to try to control it um, and to understand it and to recognize it and to allow it to happen in a managed way. Because if you try to stop people from improvising, you're just going to drive improvisation underground. People will still improvise. They'll just hide it. They'll be surreptitious about it. And that's really dangerous because you want this stuff to be visible for a number of reasons. Firstly, because you want to know what's going on. And secondly, because if somebody successfully, you know, improvises successfully, a successful improvisational intervention or whatever you want to call it, then we want to learn from that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So I do my research in the project domain. But improvisation happens and is needed everywhere in the organization. It's not limited to just project managers, it's managers generally. We all improvise. Stuff happens, we have to react quickly, we have to decide what to do, and then simultaneously pretty much start doing it. <clears throat> so what is improvisation in the organizational sense? From a practical point of view, it's getting stuff done in a way that doesn't necessarily align with the original plan or process. Doing what is necessary to move forward where the plan or process has been superseded or, which, or is outdated or doesn't cover the requirements of the current situation, whatever, however you want to describe it. But academically, there is a set of theory that supports the shift towards improvisational work in areas where the original plan or process doesn't anticipate emerging requirements or issues. In other words, there are people out there who've looked at organizational improvisation, they've unpicked it, they've looked at the component parts, and they've, and they've written about 
why this works or why it works more often than not. OK, and that's really useful because if you're going to step away from an agreed and jointly developed plan, and that's one of the, but the bonuses of a plan, of course, is you tend not to plan as a solo entity. You tend to sit down in a group or team to plan how you're going to do things. And shared planning means shared responsibility for outcomes. So if you follow a plan and it goes slightly awry or maybe it goes completely you know wrong then it's not entirely your fault there's shared responsibility for that you know whereas improvisation and certainly improvisation at the individual level is down to you and if it works you'll be the hero and if it doesn't then you know you need to ensure that you're doing this within a culture and a space where um, failure is tolerated and indeed, you know, encouraged. As an academic, okay, I see understanding what doesn't work as being just as important as understanding what works, okay? You still learn something, but managers don't see it like that. Managers are only interested in what works. They're not interested in what doesn't work. They're only interested in success because that's what they're being paid to produce. So we have a different mindset, you know? Um, but understanding a little bit of academic theory that underpins what you're doing is quite handy because if you're going to step away from the plan and you're going to improvise, then it might be useful to have a little bit of theory up your sleeve to explain why this is OK and why it ought to work. Does that make sense? Good. I like it when people nod. It means that ideally, well, first thing is it means you haven't gone to sleep, you know. This is actually a very intimate, you know, setup. I mean, I've I've done these with 160 people on them, um, and that and that's weird because the you know, the pictures are you know, the size of your little fingernail. So um, there is some theory out there, and the initial theory really came from some work that was published in 1998 by a couple of women from the University of Wisconsin called Christine Mormon and Anne Minor. Anne Minor, I think, is still at Wisconsin. Christine Mormon works at Duke now, and I know her quite well. Um, but they were involved in an organizational improvisation um, special interest group that presented at the 1995 Academy of Management Conference. And there's a whole issue of, I think it's Decision Science Journal, that documents all the papers that went into that. If anybody wants any of this stuff, by the way, email me and let me know. I've got, all, I've, obviously I've got all the sources um, and bibliography and stuff like that. But they were looking at stuff that Carl Weick who is a, like a legend in organizational behavior and organizational theory. Carl Weick did this stuff in the late 80s and early 90s around organizational sense making. And the people who started looking at organizational improvisation, a guy called Frank Barrett from the Naval um, Postgrad School in San Diego, um, Christine Mormon and Anne Minor, um, people like that. They started to pull this into, into a set of constructs or components um, and said, okay, let's deconstruct organizational improvisation and see what it consists of. So they decided initially, they published two papers in 1998, one in um, the Journal of 
marketing, I think, and one somewhere else. One was about improvisation in new product development. And the other one was about how you learn from successful improvisation. And I can let people have the, re uh, the references to this. And they said that the initial three constructs, the three components that you need in order to improvise is you need creativity, which is really they defined as new ideas about how to achieve things. You rely on a certain amount of intuition about what is possible within the structure and resources and capability of the organization. And a lot of that comes from experience, by the way. You know, we talk about experienced project managers who've been around the tracks a few times um, and they build up this intuitive gut feel for what's possible within the structure and resources and capability of the organization. Because there's no point in thinking about stuff that's outside of the structure and resources and capability of the organization, because that's going to fail. So you need to bound this with something. And the third element that they talked about was something called that they call bricolage, which is about making the best of whatever resources you have to hand in a particular set of circumstances. And when we talk about resources, we're talking about human resources, we're talking about physical resources, we're talking about financial resources. Okay, so that was the starting point. And they defined improvisation as the degree to within to which composition and execution converge in time. In other words, you decide what to do and then you immediately start to do it. You're improvising. So that was the starting point. And then about three years later, Anne Miner and Christine Mormon and another woman called Paula Bassoff wrote another paper, which is a challenge to read, to be fair. It's in a journal called Administrative Science Quarterly, which is one of those journals that insists on you, you know, sort of making your paper at least 60 pages long, even though you could probably say it in 10. Um, and, and it likes big words. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend anybody plowing through this, but in that paper, they said, okay, we're still here with creativity, intuition and bricolage, but we think there's more. Adaptation, as in adaptation of existing routines. In other words, I've done this before somewhere, or I have a problem. It looks a bit like something I came across 18 months ago. Then I did this. So maybe if I pull out that sort of what I did last time out of my internal sort of tacit memory store and adapt it a little bit to the new set of circumstances, then maybe that will work. And A, I'm not taking as much risk because it's been done before. And B, you know, I'm halfway there with it already, so it's easier. So I think adaptation is a really important thing. Compression as in much improvisation is around compression of time scales and shortening and simplifying steps in, in, in a process in order to deliver more quickly. Innovation, as in deviation from existing practices and knowledge. And that all leads to learning. And, and the learning thing is really important. So I sort of see that as I say, I think that the adaptation thing, I think, is really important because experienced managers, they rely on that adaptation of stuff they've done before to respond quickly and to take less risk. So to me, we have these three inputs, creativity, intuition and bricolage, intuition being, you know, a gut feel for what will work, creativity being new ideas and bricolage being the resources that you have to hand. We then apply some process by adapting stuff that we've done before or compressing um, ste steps in the process or innovating in some way. And then ultimately, hopefully we have a successful improvisational intervention, which we learn from and then we feed that learning back into the next improvisation that we do. And over the last couple of years, what I've realized is actually, we could also call adaptation an input. It could be an input as well as a process because it depends on stuff that we already have. 
up here, you know, tacit knowledge. So this sort of explains why improvisation ought to work. There is some solid theoretical theory, sorry, empirical and, you know, sort of, you know, tested theory around how these various elements work that explain why improvisation ought to be successful. And it also builds confidence. And all managers need the confidence to try new things based on a creative idea and the intuition based on experience that, will, that it will be effective. And I sort of started to think about, okay, this is where those people out there, you guys who run workshops in improvisation for individuals and small groups, maybe this is where you come in. There are problems with improvisation. It's not straightforward. I mean, you know, there's this whole thing about managing risk. Um, audit and compliance people are very wary of stepping away from plans and process. When you start off improvising, you know, you have to set a framework for people to improvise within and relax that, that framework as people get more competent at improvising. And the learning thing, I think, is, is very important because if you learn from a successful improvisational intervention, then what you're really doing is you're developing what I call emerging best practice, a new and better way of doing things within the organization. So all these things have to be resolved by organizations, but it helps if people have the skills to at least, you know, understand how to start doing that. And there's a lot of talk about agility these days. And one of the things, one of the problems I have in working in project management is that everything these days is shifting to this agile project management model. And people who love agile project management say, oh, all projects should be agile. You know, you, you, you're, you're, you know, you're being dynamic and you're lots of short iterations and learning as you go along. And yeah, for some projects, that's great. For software development projects and stuff like that, that's fine. I wouldn't want people to be using agile project management if they're decommissioning a nuclear power station, for example. You know, I'd want them to be following the processes and procedures there, especially if I lived near there. You know, um, when I was lived in the UK, I used to live near a, a naval dockyard, four or five miles away, um, where they decommissioned nuclear submarines and, re and refueled them, you know, with radioactive fuel rods. And I always, and overlooking the dockyard and the submarine pens was a housing estate. And I thought I would not buy a house on that housing estate for all the money in the world. No way I would I want to live that near. Yes, Paul. What would you want them to do if they came across something unexpected that a panel was not where it said it was going to be in the design or more liquid came out of something than there was well in there. that's an interesting point because you hope that that will never happen but it does <laughs> and, and, and yes it does i mean look at Chern look at chernobyl and look at you yeah. know um, uh, uh, you know stuff like that um and 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 to be fair i mean i'm not sure that improvisation can cope with stuff like that i mean look at look at um the gulf oil spill you know the um, what five or six years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, yeah, the um, the BP um, oil rig that that started pumping oil out into the the Gulf, they had a disaster plan. It's just that they'd never tested it, and when they did test it, it didn't work. And so yeah, they they improvised like crazy to try and mend it, but it took them six weeks to stop the flow. I wonder if that's to do with being in a mindset of things will go according to plan. So they're not in a state of readiness to improvise. They're improvising in those senses completely. There are there are certainly emergency yeah. measures. There are certainly organ there are certainly organizational domains that are 
extremely uncomfortable with stepping away from from you know agreed and um tested process but stuff does go wrong you know um there's no doubt about that um but organizations these days they need agility they need organizational nimbleness they need the ability to quickly pivot to exploit new opportunities they need to adjust to new realities caused by turbulent organizational environments you know stuff's changing fast out there and certainly has been in the last year you know so all that requires creativity and innovation different thinking confidence the ability to step away from the normal and maybe improvisation and improvisational skills will help here you know um organizations need help with this and improvisation tends to be an individual or small group action okay People within organizations have to have the confidence to try different things, to know how to encourage experimentation, to trust the organization to allow them to do that, you know, that culture thing, to understand that this is a learning experience. And I think that the trusting the organization to allow them to do this is a really important thing because all this comes down to a supportive culture and a supportive organizational climate to allow people to try new and different things. And I suspect that many of you as consultants and as trainers and as um, small group facilitators, you know, you're involved in changing culture and changing organizational mindsets. That's what you see as your role, I would say. Yes, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. So, you know, there is a link because I'm coming at this from the organizational end and saying it's okay for organizations to do this and there's some theory and you're coming it from the coming at it from the other end and saying hey you know um if you want to thrive and you know survive and thrive in this turbulent environment you need people who can do this stuff mm -hmm. and you need a culture that allows them the space to try that so, you know, you're preparing people, as Paul has just said in the chat, you're preparing people to, to improvise, you know, to, um, to, you're preparing people with the skills to be able to function in this new world. Um, and, and, there, and it will be a new world. I mean, you know, um, we're, we're living in pandemic times at the moment and it's very scary, but we will get back to normal. It's just that the normal will be a new normal. It won't be the normal that we were used to. It'll be a new normal and everybody will have to adjust to that. And organizations will have to adjust to that in order to survive. And they'll need people who have certain skills in order to be able to do that. So I've carried out most of my work in the project domain, but most areas within organizations have to step away from process and use an intuition and improvisational skill set at times. Um, so we're talking about the same thing. We're just approaching it from different directions. I'm approaching it from the, at the organizational level and you're approaching it at the individual and small group level. At least I suspect you are, most of you. And being able to explain that there's solid empirical theory behind organizational improvisation might actually make it easier to sell to the people that you're trying to sell your services to. You know, if you're trying to sell your training, your facilitation, your, um, you know, your expertise in building new skill sets in employees, then it might be useful to say, by the way, we're not just making this up. You know, there is solid empirical academic theory that demonstrates why and how this works. And if anybody wants me to expand on that, by the way, I'm very happy to do that, you know, outside of this, you know, I'll give you my email address. I have all the literature, I have all the papers, etc. Yes, Paul. I love this contention that being able to explain that there's solid empirical theory behind organizational improvisation might make it easy to sell and um, you've set out a, a framework for that if you took a, a wider perspective is it 
still true that there's actually not very much solid empirical theory about this, that it's a, a highly neglected area of exploration and that um, it, it still lacks the respectability and centrality that we might like it to have. I think that there's more than there used to be. OK, when we started off, I mean, when you looked at stuff around the, the, the turn of the millennium, a lot of the stuff out there about improvisation was about comparing it with jazz musicianship and with improvisational theatre and stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's not really, well, not really, it's not empirical, but there is, there, people are starting to become interested in this. I'm, I'm going to be stepping away from this, you know, because I'm, I'm going to be retiring soon and I probably won't continue to do this in Just retirement, but there are people who are coming up who are doing this. You know, um, I, would, I, super, I, I examined a PhD not that long ago from Australia um, that was looking at this from a guy called Chris Biesenthal, who was looking at this and did some very interesting empirical research. Um, there are other people who are doing this stuff as well. Um, there's a guy called Stuart Clegg, who is an extremely well-respected and highly, highly, you know, um, respected academic uh, professor. And he's getting into this stuff now, you know. Um, so there are people who are real names in the field who are starting to look at this in a much more rigorous way. Um, we're probably not there yet, but we're a lot further ahead than we were, say, five years ago. So it's coming. Um, and there is stuff out there, you know, where that you can point to and say, look, you know, this paper, I don't want you to read the whole 40 pages, but this paper basically says that they've done all this empirical work and they've talked to, you know, 700 managers and, the, and, and these are the results and etc. So there is more of it. Um, there probably isn't enough, but it is becoming more respected. And of course, most of my stuff was done in project management, but there are people doing this elsewhere as well. Um, it is improving, there's no doubt. And, you know, being able to point to some of that and say, look, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to equip your people to be able to to work in this environment and to contribute towards this. Um, I think that, you know, that's very valuable. And, you know, I, it must be difficult to sell, you know, your work and particularly in, in today's, you know, difficult, challenging times. Yes, Kay. Thank you. Uh, could you please put in the chat box the names, Chris Biesenthal and the second person you mentioned? Could you please type them into the chat box? Yeah, sure. Thanks. But I can let you see some of this stuff. While you're doing that, one of the things that I'm setting up at the moment is a think tank for applied improvisation as an AIN project, where we'll look at where is applied improvisation going. And it would be really interesting to get yours and, and everyone who's on the call, that your ideas about how we might formulate that, who we might bring into it. I'm sure it's going to benefit from having some of the academic perspectives in there. Happy if to do that. Research going on. Yeah, I'm always happy to do that. Um, yeah, no problem. So, yeah, being able to explain the, the solid empirical theory, you know, might actually help you to sell this stuff. Um, there's lots of other stuff as well. I mean, the stuff about creativity and creative use of resources. Um, I developed a matrix along with a colleague of mine to assist in deciding when this, when improvised work works best at different types of businesses and domains and work. Um, there are links with innovation and change. There are links with organizational agility. There's all sorts of stuff out there. Okay. Um, my email address is here. Um, please feel free to shoot me an email if you want to know more about this or if you want some of the sources or you want me to send you, um, you know, some of the papers, some of the papers I, I have in PDF format um, so I can, I, I can fire those off. Um, 
some of my papers, I think some of my earlier ones are in the AIN repository, I think already. Um, maybe I ought to update that and put some more stuff in. Um, this is my, um, my personal uh, pu publications webpage. There are 20 odd publications there. Um, and if you click on the title of the paper, um, you know, that's a PDF link which will jump up a PDF copy of the paper. So you can download those um, or just shoot me an email and let, and let me know. Um, but um, there's quite a bit of, of stuff there. Uh, there are also lists of conference papers. They're not necessarily available you know, for download, but if, people, if anybody wants them, then I have them obviously, and, and I'm happy to let people have them. Um, Kay is frantically writing this down. Have you, have you got it now? Because I want to switch slides. Uh, so that's basically what I was going to say. Um, and obviously, um, I'm very open to any sort of questions. I'm happy to stay here pretty much as long as you like. I mean, if we get past one o'clock in the, uh, in, if we get past one o'clock, then I might reserve the right to go and get a glass of wine. But you know, it's it's only up as, it, it it's only ten to twelve here at the moment, so that's good. Um, I try not to start drinking before twelve in lockdown. <laughs> it's funny because I was to, I was in. Um, I was in the Caribbean a couple of years ago. We bought a bought an apartment there, and then we sold it because we were it was really boring. There was nothing to do, uh, and all the expats in the Caribbean, all they do is drink all day. Um, and I'm sure that's common to our expats in many places. But I was talking to this guy, and I said, "Well, how do you cope? You know?" Do you? He said, "Well, of course, I never drink before midday." And I went, "Okay, yeah, yeah." Um, and his wife's looking at him, and going, "Really?" And he said, well, obviously beer doesn't count. You know, beer is just rehydration. And I, I don't drink rum before midday. And I thought, the guy was smashed at four o'clock in the afternoon every day, you know, and I thought, this is not for me. <laughs> but, but, you know, I do like a glass of wine with my lunch. I have a thing on my wall in, in the kitchen that says, if a meal doesn't include wine, it must be breakfast. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Please, fire I away. Guess, Steve, uh, I have a question. Yes, yes, Chen. Yeah, actually, I have like uh, uh, two questions. One is like uh, you're saying that the project manager really can have take a chance to improvise in the process. And I think it might, the, the, the purpose might be achieve uh, the goals in different ways so they can have new tools to be added on in the future. So am I right? Or what do you think about this? Like improvise to have new tools, mindset, or new process to be built up. Another uh, question is that uh, if we take, take a, like a further steps that uh, if improvisation is put on a subject or main subject uh, to, for the college study, uh, what this subject could be involved like uh, neuroscience or like a behavior or drama theater. So what kind of major could that belong to? So these two questions. Okay, well, the first question is around sort of tools and techniques versus, you know, can you just get some new techniques or new tools? And I'm not a tools and techniques guy. I am a behavioral theorist, really. That's where I came to academia from. And obviously I understand some project, you know, project management tools, but, uh, but I'm, I'm a people person. You know, I'm much more interested in um, innovation and creativity and, um, and um, communication and um, emp empathy and you know, commitment and that sort of stuff, um, leadership. Um, <clears throat> so it's a bit difficult, does, you know, the, but certainly new routines come out of improvisation. You know, if you improvise successfully and you learn from that, I, I mentioned this, what, what I call emerging best practice. Now, obviously in good organizations where they're receptive to this, emerging best practice should be captured and rolled into the next round of processes and procedures. Because if you find a better way to do things, it's, 
you know, you might as well, well, you should be adopting it for the future. So, but some organizations are better at that than others. You know, I'm, there's a difference between tacit and explicit knowledge, and I'm sure you're all aware of the difference between tacit and explicit knowledge. Um, but, you know, when you learn something, sometimes it stays in here, and sometimes, you know, you write it down. You know, sometimes it ends up in, a, in something like this, you know, so you can share it. Um, but in good organizations, there, there should be routines to share new knowledge so that it can be embedded into future activity. Um, yes, Paul. I would agree that there's a huge area of learning that gets missed in organizations because of their perspective on this. So from trying something different, something working, you'd think there was application to be had from it in uh, improving the routines and adopting. But more often than not, there isn't. But more often than not, it's missed because people aren't looking for the recipes. Organisations don't, don't capture this. What sadly. they do is they get very interested in something that goes wrong, have a big inquiry into it and blame and sack people. And there's very little to learn from that other than yeah. don't do that thing again. The thing so is, this, you, this switch you, of emphasis yeah. is needed and improvisation can lend it's, itself to Obviously, that. it's better if you have some sort of formal process, but you yeah. don't have to have a formal process. I mean, when I was That's a project a manager, we used to have knowledge sharing sessions. Um, there were six project managers in the organization and we used to have project sharing, you know, knowledge sharing sessions, which were basically called going to the pub on Friday after work. You know, we would go down to the bar underneath our building on Friday at 5.30 and we would sit around and we'd chat for a, an hour or sometimes longer about how the week had gone and what we'd learned and what had gone well and what had gone less well. I mean, that was very informal, but it worked for us. I mean, I think that most organisations these days would want something a little more formal than that. But it's so sad how often organisations don't take the opportunity to gather and collect and and, and share new knowledge. Um, let's face it, I mean, the, the, the waterfall model of project management, you know, you execute, execution is the third phase. The fourth phase is the post-implementation review and learning. But a lot of organizations don't even do that. You know, they, they deliver the project, they dismantle the project team. Everybody goes off to do new stuff because there's always too much stuff to do with, and not enough resource. And nobody ever goes back and says, did we get what we thought we were going to get? Are the benefits flowing through to the bottom line or to the efficiencies we expected or whatever? And what did we learn from doing this that we can reuse? You know, that seems to me to be common sense, but lots of organizations just don't do that. What about Sarah's question where I'm interpreting this, but the issue is that the structures and the personnel are not supportive of the people within the organization so they have to improvise to get around things i think a lot of improvisation is you know, sort of triggered by trying to get around things you know um one of the problems is that organizations you know they call them organizations because things are supposed to be organized you know a set of processes and procedures to follow to to you know to to reach an end an end result which hopefully is products and services <laughs> out of the door and profit you know but things change you know we we live in extremely turbulent times at the moment organizations are operating in extremely competitive environments you know you could you could be you know, developing a new product or service and suddenly one of your competitors comes out with something that renders that completely obsolete. There's no point in carrying on because you're going to end up developing something that nobody wants. I mean, look at the iPod. I use the iPod as an example in my class. You know, we all had CD Walkmans, those of us who were old enough. Um, and that was the way we listened to music. And you carried around, you know, a thing on your, a, ba a bag of CDs and, and the Walkman and, you know, you went jogging and the CD used to skip all the time because 
you were jogging or whatever, but the Sonys and Samsungs of this world were making hundreds of millions of dollars a year out of selling this stuff. And I'm sure that in the year 2000, you know, Sony had a five year plan for implementing and improving and dominating the market in mobile music using portable CD players. 2000 and late 2001, early 2002, MP3 players came out. The iPod came out. It was an order of magnitude, many orders of magnitude better than a CD player. And within literally a few months, nobody wanted CD players. Everybody wanted MP3 players. And the vast majority of people wanted iPods because they were really cool. So Sony's income stream and planning was immediately obsolete. The income stream disappeared. The plan was obsolete. And there was no point in carrying on with that plan. They had to go, they had what, what one of my colleagues calls an oh shit moment. <laughs> oh shit, what are we going to do now? You know? Um, and what they did, obviously, is they started to develop MP3 players, but they were, they were two years behind the curve. And by, you know, by the time they got an MP3 player out into the marketplace, you know, Apple had 80% of the market. You know, things change. And there's no point in carrying on as if they hadn't, because that's the way to failure, you know? You know, there are, there, are prob there are probably very few companies out there now making horse-drawn carriages, because we don't use horse-drawn carriages anymore. The only person who uses the ho a horse-drawn carriage that I know, and I don't know her permanently, is the Queen, you know? And she uses it twice a year. You know, th there's not a lot of market anymore. You know, things change. And things are changing quickly. And with artificial intelligence and, you know, and all that stuff that's coming along, stuff is changing even more quickly. You know, in five years time, you'll be able to buy a car that doesn't have a steering wheel and you can sit in the back. That's a little frightening, I admit, but it's coming. I'm sorry, you were going to say something, Richard. Yeah, sorry. Um, th thanks for uh, the, the talk today. And it's a lot resonated. Um, and you, you, you talked a lot about uh, individuals being in, uh, able to improvise, uh, individual project managers being able to improvise. I actually work quite a bit with projects, uh, but more at the upfront end of it um, in creating an improvisational, almost improvisational plan alongside the other, alongside the, uh, the more traditional plan. And that kind of setting, for me, the kind of, it, the improvisation is around a, um, freedom within a structure so those kind of things about you know being upfront about what is it that we're all trying to do getting the whole team not just a, a single manager understanding what is it we're trying to achieve and what are, what are the things that are going to impact us and what capabilities have we got and how would we respond to things in the future and kind of setting up a, a an expectation that things are going to change up front and i don't know how many organizations really do that and i was wondering whether you have kind of i've never heard of that and i think it's brilliant you know, I think every organization should do that. But, you know, that's that's a very forward thinking, you know, way of looking at projects and, you know, anticipating that improvisation will happen. And, uh, you know, let's try and at least put some boundaries around it mm -hmm. and talk about how it's going to work. To be fair, it's usually ones that have got stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do we move forward? Well, well, there's 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 not research yet in that in that area on kind of creating a framework or a structure that enables that to happen. Then, yeah, most it's of, kind of a, it's agility, but actually setting it up to be agile rather than just telling people to be. Yeah, most of the the improvisational stuff is around people. It's not around you know let's build this in, let's build improvisation into the plan. Mm. It's about it's really about when the plan falls on its face you know, then this is what we do, but we tend to do it informally rather than more formally. And it would be useful to have people, you know, around who have the skills to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that planning for future improvisation is actually quite cool. This is something that the Applied Improvisation Network has always done. We've been an improvisational organization from the outset. So it is built into 
how we evolve and develop. And I think there are some voluntary organizations that are more like that than some traditional organizations. Okay. I like because your they, phrase. No, I like your phrase, people. freedom within structure. I like yeah. that. I've been using that for well for 20 years. So <laughs> it's well, slowly getting out there. We obviously don't talk enough. <laughs> no. Well, I, I talked to Frank Barrett 25 years ago and uh, the jazz guy. Very yeah. interesting. But yeah, they're not looking at organizations. He's saying, oh, he can see some similarities between yeah. jazz and organization. Yeah. That's, Frank's a nice guy. Um, he's a really nice guy. It's a very yeah. shrewd observation. Then, isn't yeah, it? I think he might have retired now or certainly Probably. he must be getting close. He wrote a book about, le about improvisational leadership yes. called Yes to the Mess, which is yes. actually re a really good read. Can we ask Jim Bob to say something about theatre people having uh, an edge at improvising yeah. with their project managers? Uh, thank you. Uh, and a lot of exciting ideas here because my background is I was an engineer for 35 years, worked with project managers within a, a multinational corporation, and we had one way of doing things. But I also worked a lot in wastewater treatment plant upsets and chemical process emergencies. So I got, maybe I got a chance to uh, improvise more than I, I would have had. Okay, when I retired and I got involved with the community theater and improv, got the feeling that this is very familiar, okay? Because a problem comes up, you have to you know, uh, decide on a course of action and for that. And what I really loved about today's, uh, uh, today's talk is now I've got a vocabulary to try to explain why things seem to work better. But uh, example, the local community theater, um, you know, trying to balance, you know, the, the, the overriding principle is the show must go on. We have a project to do. And I've seen some amazing things happen when, you know, uh, people got sick, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, materials weren't delivered on time. And the, uh, and the, the, you know, the director of the theater just uh, amazing. He just kind of said yes and and worked up a solution. And it ranged everything from um, uh, uh, you know, you know, changing special effect. You know, a, one, a special effect didn't work, so developing something that uh, substituted and was equally effective. And uh, you know, just little things that they could do with light. Yes, orbiting the giant hairball. Just writing that down. Orbiting the giant hairball. Yeah, he worked for uh, Hallmark at a time when Hallmark was mostly uh, greeting cards. And he was a very creative guy and he uh, realized that, uh, you know, things have changed and maybe Hallmark should be involved in other things. And so, and he brought in the idea of selling uh, uh, novelties and uh, bric a brac uh, videos, et cetera. To Hallmark, and if you go to a Hallmark store today, cards are all the way in the back, take up less than you know uh, ten percent of the, the store space. If there's a store, <laughs> and Hallmark uh, makes a lot of more money from uh, with the uh, ornaments and decorative stuff there, but he recognized that he was too innovative. He needed the giant hairball and that gravity to keep him from uh, working on useless ideas and give him structure. So he, I think he found that. Yeah, I think there's story. a lot more stuff out there now about um, mm -hmm. improvisational working practices. I mean, mm -hmm. the, I was I was looking at stuff on um, on effectuation, for example, which is about sort of the way that people improvise within uh, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at stuff about holacracy. Um, which, which again has some links. Um, and there's another one, I can't remember. Hang on a minute. Um, I think I had the, the paper here the other day. Um, ambidexterity. Um, and um, what's the other one I was looking for? Um, one of the things about being in your office, at least they've got all this stuff lying around. Um,
Yeah, holacracy. Um, and then, what was this? Oh, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lalou. Um, yeah, so there, you know, there's a lot more out there now about stepping away from structure and about equipping people to step away from structure and about, um, allowing people the space to try, you know, different things in different styles. Um, and, but nobody's really pulled it all together. That's the trouble, no. you know? That, that could be the role of this think tank to... Yeah, okay. Um, to do that, at least... In yeah, effectuation, holacracy, and the dexterity. Yeah, that, that, mm. that's right. That, and yeah, Lalu. Yeah. I, prob I probably pronounced it wrongly, but... Um, Paul's obviously got all this stuff stacked up in his office on all these bookshelves. I won't go and get it all. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it here. Well, and, most uh, of mine's in the office because I have a relative. Comment. I have a relatively small apartment, so you know, yeah. most of my stuff's in the office, which means I don't really see it so much now. So, but, if you you're know, thinking beyond individuals or small groups improvising, then Caesar's got this idea of China as a country that's improvising. Right maybe India as well, um, that there's so much rapid development going on yeah. that, they're all, that they're improvising in ways, again, but probably not recognizing it as such. I think that's right, because um, certainly in the, um, if you go back to the 1980s, which you mentioned, then, you know, um, only the elite had, a man, you know, had any sort of higher education. Um, so, as they relaxed communism and encouraged people to start their own businesses, uh, people didn't know how to do that. You know, they, they were literally making it up as they went along. Um, there's a really interesting book called Jugard Innovation, J-U-G-A-A-D, Innovation, which talks about innovating in particularly in India, but in cultures where there is no real wealth and you have to try and build something with minimal resources. Really interesting book. It was written, probably written about seven or eight years ago now. Can't remember the author. But, you know, in, in areas, in places, cultures where there is no infrastructure to educate people about how to start businesses and about, you know, then, you have to just get stuck in and have a go. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can absolutely see that in China and possibly more so in India, I don't know. Um, is, there a, is there a sense in which once you see things as being complex and not complicated, that actually improvisation is by definition what happens all the time? Because if it's, you know, the, this idea complicated as things they might be really difficult to work out but there's a there's a solution and if you work your way through it you can get to the end mm -hmm. and the complex being you th throw something at it, it but you don't really know how it's going to respond so you've got to sense how it responds and then react and yeah well, we talk about complexity increasing though so by definition there's no doubt that that um so certainly you know projects are more complex than we originally thought of thought you know like 30 years ago when i became a project manager it was okay well you decide what to do and then you put it in a plan and then you do it but you know the the interlinking you know connections i mean complexity is about connections it's about the number of different links you have to different other bits of stuff that can affect what you're doing um as soon as you've got people in it which is what your very first point was steve that the, that simplicity of project management works for certain things, but when people are involved, you bring complexity into it. And if well, we're not, all unique. I mean, I talk, I talk about um, you know, the fact that we all see things differently. You know, we, we can all look at the same issue and we'll all see sli something slightly different in terms of the problem. And we'll all see something slightly different in terms of the solution. 
because we have different knowledge bases and different experience bases and, you know, all that stuff, you know. So the social construction of reality is what the, is what research academics call it. What we're all doing all of the time is we're looking at a particular circumstance, set of circumstances, and we're constructing our own view of how we see that, our own view of the reality of the situation. But my view of the, of the reality of what we're looking at will not necessarily you know, coincide with Kay's view or Paul's view or Colin's view because we have different thought processes, we have different educational uh, bases, we have different knowledge bases, we've been brought up maybe in different cultures, um, you know, so we construct all that um, and that means that dealing with people is challenging <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, and Sarah's noted the same thing. Yes, thank you Steve. And are there any other questions or comments that people would like to make before we close? Kay. Yes, Kay. I seem to recall you said at some point during your talk, you mentioned the idea of that we need to sell this idea using the empirical evidence to sell the idea of improvising. And that I find that can sometimes be challenging because when someone hires me to present an, an applied improvisation workshop, I'm not necessarily communicating or dealing with the top bosses, the top no. managers of the company. I might be dealing with someone in the HR department, for example. Yeah. Um, but they don't have the budget. And, right. Um, <laughs> or the power. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like last year, I, um, I was hired to present uh, some workshops for, a May, for um, the Asia Pacific region. Some staff members came to Hong Kong for a big conference um, from a big global management consulting firm. And it was all for, for the women. And the company, the HR manager, wanted a workshop for them to learn more about how to be more confident in stepping up and expressing an opinion. And that was great. We did the workshop. They were very happy with it. But the bosses, the managers, were not there. So these women went back to a workplace where the improvisational yeah. mindset was not part of the corporate culture. Yeah, because it's not supported from above. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and that and that's problematical. I mean, I I don't have any answers about how you how you sell this stuff to get work. It's just that it might be useful if you're in front of the right person to say, look, you know, I'm, this is not like pie in the sky stuff. There is <laughs> empirical theory that you know that actually explains why this is successful and why you know in a turbulent organizational environment um, these sort of skills are useful um but how you get to the person who makes the decision to tell them that i'm not quite sure you know and i, I appreciate that that's the problem you know you're selling you're selling your services to people who don't have the ultimate decision making um authority mm -hmm. and you don't know how strongly the people that you've pitched to are going to push you know what 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 you're trying to sell um yeah so um so the route in through looking at companies like netflix which explicitly adopt improvisational practice mm -hmm. and have blown away the competition might be an, another persuasive angle any other questions comments uh, I, I just add one. I've been having this conversation, or, or you know, having been a pro, uh, PM for twenty odd years as well, Steve, uh, and then bumped into theatre and improv in the last six or seven, and hence what's led me to IAM. Um, so uh, very similar, without without the academic slant that you have. Um, but I think it's just listening to the conversation. There's there's a couple of things. There's one trying to to link into K, Kay's point. I think trying to build a conversation that has meaning for the for people who do this every day because the academic thing will work in talking on an msc about project management in a business school but most people Which is what will, i do <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely so for that audience who have paid money to go and get better qualifications absolutely 
I think it's then what about the 95% who just do it on a daily basis, do some stuff, uh, are working within the constraints of the organization they've talked about. And so basically it's trying to, I think, put it in a language that will make meaning to them to say, why, why do you need to do something differently in the way it connects with the kind of, you know, how do, how do they change? What are the benefits of that? Almost having the language for that is, is interesting. Um, and I think that's what one part. And a second, uh, just another quick thought before leaving is, I think having been starting in projects, uh, as I say, probably mid nineties, starting in technology and then organizational change and moving through. Oh, you and I have a similar background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so therefore, um, I think it's an interesting one that we haven't probably talked about today, which is the label of projects has just simply over that kind of part time been applied to more and more places yeah. because obviously civil engineering has been doing projects for lots and lots of years that's kind of where it all started technology then in the 90s was fast moving then adopted a project principles and then business have done it now we kind of software dev is trying to do agility and then someone suddenly the rest of the organization thinks it needs to be agile and to your points of sometimes that's useful and sometimes it's not and so all this kind of thing, but I think the having them the being doing agile projects and having an um, and building in an agility, almost a daily daily agility, are two different things. And so therefore, I, personally, I think our work is to do the latter. How do you how, how do you create an agile mindset? Which is the great thing about our world is we have the tools to be able to do it. In other words, the practical things. And that's what many other places don't have. They talk about it, but we have things that can help you change on a daily basis. The practical, how you flex your muscles and basically put it into your system. And so I think that's, that's you know, the conversations I've been having over the last few years. And so how do you get that almost, I call it collaborative yoga, because you're working on the mind and the body. And so therefore you actually kind of help people think in different ways, which then... Uh, moves into the project sphere well you i mean you're certainly right about you know projects becoming a generic term for stuff that's not really a project you know um actually that your second point um sort of a stimulated a, an idea about i don't know probably getting on for 20 years ago now when the agile software development thing started they, a bunch of people got together and they wrote something called the Agile Manifesto. Yeah. Okay. And the Agile Manifesto became the basis for, you know, this is what we're about and this is the mindset we have and this is what we're trying to achieve. Would there be any mileage in trying to write a sort of an improvisation manifesto mm -hmm. that AIN sponsors and not, not sponsors in the financial term because I don't think it needs that, but which AIN but and, the, the, and the collective expertise within AIN comes together to develop, which can then be used as a, as a starting point, a framework for you know, rippling that out. Two thoughts on that. One is that the project as a, as a field in which to do improvisation might be very fruitful as compared to the organization being improvisational or the individuals being improvisational. The individuals already being well covered, I think, by a lot of current practice. But improvisational projects could show a lot of success, particularly with project having become this more generic term, because it's not got to be there forever, like the organization. Well, the, um, the whole idea of projects is that, you know, it's a unique, you unique, know, a unique thing with a recognized and given yeah. deliverable. Um, so I think that, that's very suited to an improvisational approach, which is a lot of what we've been talking about in, in today's session. And um, I really like the idea of an improvisation manifesto. Mm. It would read remarkably similar to the Agile manifesto. <laughs> if, you, if you look at the Agile manifesto, it's virtually a definition of improvisation yeah i've not looked at it for some time but yes it, it I, I when i did look at it i thought well there's nothing new here i'm doing this all you know yeah. but but you it, know why not very catchy yeah but you know the improvisation manual or 
improvisation manifesto, improvisational manifesto, whatever you want to call it, you know, and I'd, perf I'd be very happy to, you know, to jump in and be part of trying to develop that. I'll be calling a gathering soon. <laughs> I had a feeling you might. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Uh, we'll, no we'll problem at all. Anytime. Recording.